And thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Emily Keller. I'm the Special Secretary of Opioid Response for the Moore Miller Administration. It's an honor and privilege to be here this evening. And as most of you know, we are on a town hall series in all 24 jurisdictions in Maryland. I thought it was important to hear from all parts of our state. That's something we'll get to a little bit later. So this is number nine out of 24, and what an incredible turnout. So we appreciate all you guys taking an hour or two with your evening this evening. First tonight, I would like to introduce the superintendent of Queen Anne's County Public School, Dr. Patricia Salins. Good evening. There we there go. You go. <laughs> Patty Salen, superintendent, and again, a welcome to Ken Island High School. Welcome to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Um, we're very thankful for the OOCC grant. It allows us to build awareness with our students and our community, and we're very excited about this evening because we can't do more um, than, you know, to make sure that we are continue to combat this opioid crisis that we can. So we all need to work collectively together to do that. And we're very excited that you're here this evening. So thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Up next today, we have Dr. Joseph Ciotola, Queen Anne's County Health Officer and EMS Director. Dr. Ciotola, thanks for joining us. Good evening and welcome everyone. And I could sit up here for probably 30 minutes and tell you all the things we've done since 2012 for addiction and opioids. But the real issue, we need to hear from you. What do you feel you need? What do you feel that you don't know? What do you feel that we should be doing and strive to do? But before I ask those questions to the audience, there's a health officer in the room, Bill Webb from Kent County, who has rather exciting news to tell all of us in the midshore who have been dealing with the opioid issues and treatment options and detoxification since this catastrophe of opioids has struck this, not only our jurisdiction, but the entire state of Maryland. Bill, thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Just to be brief, my name is Bill Webb. I'm the, Kent, I'm the, the health officer for the Kent County Health Department. This is a Queen Anne's County event. Uh, in Kent County, we have a, a, a regional facility called the AF Witsit Center. It's our, it's our SUD treatment program, residential treatment program. And I'm excited to announce that, that, that we, we have been offering walk-in services on Wednesday mornings. Uh, we are now offering walk-in services on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. And starting in the middle of October, we will have walk-in services on, on Friday as well. And then later in the month, we are going to have availability on Thursday evenings as well. And our treatment, what's exciting about our treatment is with that we offer acute withdrawal management, detoxification services. It's uh, one of the only facilities on the shore that does that. Our, our primary population for, for, for this treatment, you know, we focus on the Medicaid population and the uninsured. So, uh, we're excited to have this announcement and also the services available for everybody on the Eastern Shore and also for anyone on the, on the Western Shore who needs it as well. Thank you. Bill, thank you. Thank you. Now at this time, I'd like to introduce Major Amor from the Sheriff's Office. Hi, I'm Major Amor from uh, the Queen Anne Sheriff's Office. I came over to uh, Queen Anne's County about three and a half years ago um, from the other side of the bridge. Uh, they had a lot of programs over here, but Queen Anne's County is, uh, is, is doing it right. We'll put it that way. Um, statistically, when I started over here, we kind of look at everything uh, across the board. And I look back through some of the numbers right now. Since 2018 to present, we've had a reduction in overdoses by nearly 388%. Uh, statistically, the numbers are low, but at the same time, 
these are great numbers. Uh, the overdose, overdose deaths are nearly 267% reduction since 2018. That's huge. Um, I never saw those numbers on the other side of the bridge. Now, again, I've worked in many jurisdictions on the other side of the bridge, um, but over here, you guys are doing it right. There's a huge response from Department of Emergency Services, Health Services, um, the courts, um, the commissioners, the state's attorney's office, and I don't know if a lot of people know, this county was one of the first counties to actually prosecute one of the drug dealers um, for selling and uh, causing a death of an individual from the county. Um, it was pioneering because most other counties then adopted these same kind of philosophies. Um, this county also, again, reach out uh, to, to a lot of the court systems um, for, for drug treatment. We now have, uh, I don't wanna step on toes here, but we now have a new program with the circuit court and it's fantastic. And uh, want, these couldn't happen without the collective uh, partnerships that we do have with not only the state, uh, stakeholders from, from the folks that are up here, our schools, we have programs in the schools like DARE um, that are robust and we're trying to expand on those. Um, some of the community awareness programs obviously have been in effect for nearly 20 years with this county. Um, and again, the numbers attest to that, uh, to that reduction. So uh, keep up the good work. And then I, again, the girls in the back, I assume you're from like the, uh, the students that kind of support anti-drugs, anti-drinking. Um, my daughter was in that uh, when she was coming to this school. It's a fabulous, fabulous program and it's well worth it. Um, some of the other youth probably should adhere to some of that and, and, and follow your footsteps. It only makes you a better person and makes the county a better place. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Dula Rickard. I'm a deputy state's attorney with Queen Anne's County State's Attorney's Office. I'm here on behalf of my office and uh, Lance Richardson, state's attorney. Um, I just wanted to let you know that our office is committed in working with law enforcement and the courts in order to um, make sure that um, we're targeting um, drug dealers, going after people who are um, distributing poison to our citizens, especially our younger citizens. Um, we're committed to the prosecution of um, the drug distribution. Additionally, um, while there are, there are people who are charged with um, simple possession crimes and crimes that are um, related to um, people who have addiction issues like um, thefts, um, and we are cognizant of um, why people are possessing and why people are committing other crimes in order to support their habits. And we do try and work with those individuals in order to um, get them on the path of sobriety and health. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that we do work um, every day with law enforcement in the investigation of um, people who are um, dealing drugs. And um, at this time, I'd like to introduce um, the Honorable uh, Judge Knight, um, who can tell you a little bit about a specific program um, with drug court. Thank you. Good, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us to talk about what's happening in Queen Anne's County. Um, I have to go back to the Justice Reform Act, which happened in 2017, which was kind of land slaping legislation that reformed the justice uh, uh, community in looking at addiction issues as a piece of that. We were always treating these types of crimes of just lock them away and then um, we will be done with them. But they're gonna get out and they're gonna come back home and they're gonna come back home to their family, to their job and to places that they feel comfortable. And if we don't provide any treatment to them, the ways that they had will continue. So there's been lots of reforms in the justice system to look at how we treat offenders um, still trying to very harshly punish those who are distributing drugs and selling in our community, um, but look at the low level offenders as to what we need to do to help them fix the problem instead of continuing on this cycle. We started drug court, our first drug court in Queen Anne's County. We started in December, so we're only Nine months in, 10 months in, we got a grant from uh, the judiciary to hire a problem-solving court coordinator. 
We don't try, call it drug court, we call it CART, Court Assisted Recovery and Treatment. We're trying to take the language um, to be more positive for people wanting to be in it. It is a, um, it's real, they take a plea to their charge and they enter um, the program. They don't get sentenced. They continue through the program if they successfully complete the program, which is 12 months to 18 months then their charge would likely be null prost. So they have, it's very intensive. They have to come to court every two weeks. So they have to come see me. They have to be drug tested three to four times a week. They have to be in a treatment program. They have mental health treatment. We assist them in finding housing, um, safe places to live, sober living. Um, uh, try to get them to further their education. We have great resources at Chesapeake College. Some of them don't have GED, so you start at the basic level. But addressing them as a whole person to see what we can do so that we can keep them in our community but to be successful citizens. Um, so we're very excited about that program and we're hoping to uh, continue to work forward. We can't do this without everybody else working together. So there's many coalitions and groups in our county that work together. Uh, this county works very closely together. You're gonna to hear all of us tell you the same thing, but it, um, it makes our jobs a little bit easier when you can pick up the phone and talk to your colleague about what's going on and get some advice and some encouragement and to keep pushing forward. So we're happy to be here. I'm gonna introduce Commissioner Moran. Commissioner Moran is a Queen Anne's County resident. He is our county commissioner, been elected three times now. Mm -hmm. He was appointed to fill a, a term in 2013. Um, he's raising his family here in Queen Anne's County, so he's very committed to keeping this as a safe place. He sits on many boards and commissions, and I have to say the Drug Free Coalition is um, his favorite, right? Yeah, yes, it is, okay. as a matter of fact. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very right. much. So, you know, uh, I'm with the government and I'm here to help. And we, we've always heard that in, in the past. <laughs> uh, I, I take a different approach to that. Uh, since getting involved with the Drug Free Coalition in Queen Anne's County, which is, is probably the strongest uh, liaison job that I have, when I mean strong, I mean the room's always filled. Uh, our job as, as government is to, to listen to the experts, listen to the experts, listen to what they're suggesting, uh, the ideas. I mean, it, we're, at these meetings, we have all the churches, you know, we have uh, rehabilitation, we've got emergency service, we have the sheriff's department, everybody's there and, and we're all rowing in the same uh, direction. And some of the things the Drug Free Coalition has done over the years, not only to, to pull in all the support that they have, um, you know, we do everything from uh, the ambassadors. Julie's here. Julie runs the ambassadors. And, and someone mentioned that's our students in our schools that believe that they don't need drugs. They're high on life. And nothing is stronger than hearing from your peers what, what you're doing and why you're doing it. So I think it's a great program, and, and I, I'm, I'm happy to be involved with that. Uh, our posters, we do pictures. We have, we have the schools involved with the Drug Free Coalition and we judge the pictures and we hang them in our, right in our, uh, the Liberty Building. And we hang them in our, our St. Vincent's Building. So that we want the public. I mean, it's, people would come up to me and say, why are you putting these on the walls? Because we want you aware. Uh, it was probably six years ago, we put up the signs along Route 50, all the way up 301, uh, for drug awareness, for overdoses and deaths. And I wanted that one at, uh, right by the Bay Bridge. That was the one that I wanted the most because I wanted parents when they came home from work to see that sign and go home and say, what'd you do today? Get engaged with your, with your children, talk to your children, don't be afraid to talk about drugs, don't be afraid to talk about what's right and wrong. And, and that's, that's from the family values and that's, that's what we need to get. And, and we spend a lot of time in Queen Anne's County on our youth. And I think it's imperative. I think that you know, we, if we can get back to the youths and, and, and teaching them you know, what's good and what could kill you, I think it's very important. So we go in front of the sixth graders every year, the sheriff, myself, and, and the state's attorney, and we just you know, talk to them, not, not a big talk. And, and I always finish with you know, those, asking if they know the signs along the highway. And when they say yes, I say, I don't want you on my signs. I don't want you a statistic on my, on, 
on our signs. And we're starting at that young age, and we, we, we think, feel strongly that we're making a difference. So, you know, that, that's some of the things that we do. I would say that uh, in the springtime we do community panels. We're always looking for what we can be doing that we're not doing. Uh, we got Queen Anne's County goes purple. When you leave tonight, it's probably going to be dark. Just look at the front of the school when you leave. You're not going to believe it. I mean, but it's, it's again, it's awareness. It's, it's letting the public know that we have a problem. You know, I mean, we would, all of us sitting up here would love this whole room to be filled with every parent to hear some of these things. Uh, you know, I, I will say that uh, one of the best presentations I ever saw was the uh, former vice principal here with his vaping. And it's vaping's a, a big issue in Queen Anne's County, a very big issue. And you know, all these things are, are triggers to lead you to something else. And we just want to be the interference. We want to be the wall. So I'm happy to help with, with whatever the Drug Free Coalition thinks is next that we need to do. And, and if we need to do it over and over again. So, you know, we're, we're committed in Queen Anne's County to listening to the experts. And, you know, again, our health department, Narcan. I mean, I think Queen Anne's County was one of the first counties that was said, look, if you want Narcan, we're giving you Narcan. The police carry it. All the commissioners carry it. You know, anybody, any citizens can have it. I mean, because that's, you're saving lives with that. And, and it's proven over and over again. So, you know, I, I think the one thing that we're worried about, and because we, we we don't want to see the county go backwards. Our numbers are the same in deaths this year already as they were last year for the whole year. So, you know, we have our work cut out for us. We've got to find out, you know, how this is happening and, and uh, move forward from there. But, you know, it's a great group of people. I'm proud to be part of it and look forward to what we're, what's coming on the horizon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you guys for joining me this evening. It's, uh, it's truly an honor to be here tonight and to listen to you guys and to hear what's working and what's not working. Uh, we've been traveling all over the state because the Moore Miller administration, we are dedicated to creating a robust system of care for people with a substance use disorder. I would guess to say everyone in this room has been affected somehow. We've all lost loved ones, friends, daughters, brothers, sisters. I started my career in public office running for city council in the city of Hagerstown in 2016 because my lifelong best friend Ashley had a substance use disorder and I got extremely frustrated watching what I felt was our system fail her over and over and over. She struggled to access the care that she needed. Every time she was ready to say, I'm ready to go get help, there weren't beds available. Um, she was getting violation of probation charges, spending time in jail and not getting treatment, and I just got frustrated and decided I was gonna try to do something about it. Unfortunately, in 2016, Ashley lost her life to an overdose. And I share her story because I want you guys to know that this is my heart's work and this is our department's health heart's work. And we are truly dedicated to making a Maryland that is substance use free. And I know that's really easy to say and I know we're years away from that, right? But it is possible if we create a robust system of care that reaches out and touches everyone. If we do things like this and we talk to each other and we learn from each other, we can do that. I have the distinct honor of serving as the first special secretary of opioid response for the state of Maryland, and in that I oversee the Opioid Operational Command Center. I know that's a mouthful, so I'm gonna call it the OOCC from here on out. So the OOCC coordinates the statewide plan for overdose strategies. So we work with all 24 jurisdictions, the opioid intervention teams. We work with interagency departments across the state. And if I may, I have a couple of my team members here. I have Deborah, Khalil, and um, <laughs> Cassandra. I was gonna call you Cassie. <laughs> um, Casey, she hates that. If you guys could just stand and be acknowledged, please. We have a team of 10, we're small but mighty, and uh, we have like a true passion for what we do every single day. So I appreciate you guys helping put together these 24 jurisdiction tours. And I'm just gonna speak high level. As we coordinate the state strategic plan, we have five areas that we're gonna focus on. And that's kind of what I want you guys to hear high level so when we're hearing your comments, you know where we're coming from as well. Our first pillar that we're going to focus on is prevention.
We want to address trauma and av adverse childhood experiences. We want to promote school-based and after-school youth programs. I loved walking in here and seeing all the Queen Anne's County goes purple. I helped launch Washington Goes Purple, and seeing this whole state walking out tonight, I can't wait to school see the school lit purple. It's just incredible seeing the young folks that are engaging in this. And it's so important to have those youth-based interventions because let's be honest, those middle school kids don't want to hear from us. They want to hear from their peers. So I appreciate that you guys are leading the way here in this county. We are also going to focus on harm reduction. We know that harm reduction improves our chances of making connections to care by fostering and maintaining relationships with people who do use drugs. We wanna make sure that everyone has universal access to naloxone, that we're expanding wound care with the prevalence of xylazine in our illicit drug supply. We know that wound care is extremely important right now. We also wanna expand syringe service programs and drug checking initiatives so we know exactly what is in our illicit drug supply and how we can address that. Our third pillar was treatment. We want to promote equitable access to care through transportation services and telemedicine. We want to increase access to medications for opioid use disorder, promote care coordination, and increase access for adolescents, because we know that adolescent treatment is very hard to come by in this state. Our fourth pillar is recovery promoting employment and recovery and recovery-ready workplaces, increasing compensation for peer support specialists, supporting recovery high schools, and making sure that we have an environment for people who are in recovery, that they have the tools that they need to thrive. And last, our focus is public safety. We know public safety officials are often the first to come into contact with individuals who use drugs or individuals in crisis. They can help to create pathways to care that avoid the criminal justice involvement while also providing treatment and recovery services for individuals who are incarcerated. We want to make sure our public safety officials have all of the resources, training, and education that they need to help people in the environment that we're in today. We also want to promote alternatives to arrest and incarceration like LEAD program, law enforcement assisted diversion, promote treatment and recovery services in detention facilities, and expanding reentry planning services and care coordination upon release so people being released back into everyday life have the access to treatment and resources resources that they need to thrive. Maryland has made significant progress. I think we can all see that if we think back five or 10 years ago, but we're still losing seven Marylanders a day. That's seven Marylanders who are our moms and our sons and our friends and our cousins and our family members. So we still have a lot of work to do. So with that, I want to hear, there's only three people signed up for, to speak, but we're going to hear from more of you, I know. Um, I would like to hear what's working, what's not, where you think the state can help, where you think those gaps in services are. And as we go back to our office after the end of this 24 jurisdiction tour and coordinate the, the strategic plan, how we can implement these best practices and as well as the suggestions to move forward in Maryland. So up first tonight, if you could try to keep your remarks to two minutes, we're not going to like set a buzzer off or anything, but just so we can get through anyone who wants to talk. Um, up next to speak tonight, I have Paula Dickerson. Yeah, you, you can face us. So yeah, they got you. colored schools property. We're also setting in an area one mile, uh, within the one mile radius of some of the highest drug dealers and, and opioid uh, obsessive people. Coming in our backyard is a low income housing unit of three to 400 uh, low income adults, adolescents and children. On the other end of us, within another mile, is a low-income housing um, unit. We sit there unaddressed. We are the, in the perfect spot to have some of your resources in our building, yet we are unheard of most times and we are unseen. We are the perfect place for these things to be setting in. Why haven't we heard from you? And I'm sorry. It was the grace of 
Graysonville Grace Community Grace Center. Okay, thank you. We need these services. We're right in the exact place that you need us in the community. That's a gap. It's, it's a huge it's gap. Not. It's a huge gap. Outside of law enforcement, what other I services? I was going to say, are, what, what other services besides law enforcement are, 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 are we specifically with? We would love to have counselors, drug AA and NA programs in our building. We would love to have um, services that come in that would take care of people on their way out. We would love to have someone on site maybe to even be able to address when we have crisis situations. We have none of that. We have empty rooms that can be used for these type of services. In the community uh, center that you have, mm -hmm. there is a lot of... Uh, there is a lot of crime that goes around it. Uh, there's a lot of drug use. Um, we are doing our best. We are working with our federal partners, our state partners, our local partners to try to eradicate some of those issues. We've worked with the Housing Authority. Um, Department of Emergency Services uh, are, are always available. Uh, as far as some of the AA groups, um, we would have to work to try to get those groups moved up to Graysonville. There are a lot of other uh, churches and a lot of other facilities without, with, uh, within the county. So if you're open to, to, to those resources, we can certainly explore the op opportunity to have them come up to the Graysonville area. We would appreciate We'd like to but, get ahead of the problem before yeah, this unit comes And we in. would too. And that's, yeah. and that's the whole uh, point of all of us up here and all the folks that are here is to get ahead of the problem before it becomes even more of a problem. Yes. Uh, you heard me say, statistically, some of these things are down, and down significantly over the last, I don't know, since 2018. This but all, this also, oh, sorry. sorry, I don't mean to step That's, on you. This also sounds like a grant project. I mean, there is money out there to bring... Um, services Absolutely. to you, so um, you know that's. We a just place. need to get in the conversation, have a conversation. That's right, yes. and identify what you need. I can tell you from my experience in the courts, we want um, our participants to go. Uh, I, I use it in regular probation orders. You mm -hmm. need to be going to a group, AA or NA. There's not enough of them around. Exactly. They fell off during COVID and have not picked back up. A lot of them are doing it remotely because there's no group to go. But you miss that connection to people. You have that connection to people yes. at the center, so you could have a lot of influence on people. So right. I, as I, a 20 year, 28 year uh, recovered person, I know that wasn't there then when I needed it. I know it's not there now, and I do, as you say, have a heart for this kind of thing. So we can you, you to can you can you get the residents to, to show up? Absolutely. Let's let's set a date. Absolutely. We'll we'll, you know, we'll bring the show to you. Okay. We'll, you know, I mean that's. That's what the Drug Free Coalition does. We, you know, we get the answers, get the individuals to come to you, okay. fill the room, and we'll be there. So you we'll just reach out, to, reach out and give us a date, give us some, some dates, and okay. I want to make sure that everybody can get there. And okay. I live right around the corner. I can walk there. Okay. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. There's also, um, if maybe um, I can exchange contact with information with you later on, um, there is a resource um, that um, handles a lot of, um, it's more um, driving under the influence um, situations, um, but it's she's an advocate for people who are in recovery and she comes to court with a lot of people who have worked on the program and i know that there have been complaints among people who have attended that program which is over the bridge about the lack of resources here so um maybe that might be a resource and um, i can call her and maybe we can and, set something up and finally i gotta get um out there as they say big ups to doreen facet who has been uh, yes, she's amazing. She's been amazing to us and helped us so much mm -hmm. thus far to try to bring this type of information to us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Paula, Thank congratulations you. on 28 years. <laughs> That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we have Allison Davis. Is Allison here? All right, Linda Kohler. Good evening. I'm Linda Kohler, the Executive Director of Chesapeake Charities. First thing I'd like to do is just to thank you all for what you're doing. The amount of work you've done in prevention is incredible, and it has made a difference, and it will make a difference. 
So I'm coming from a little bit later in the cycle, which is the folks who are already addicted to drugs. And many of them, you know, they start in high school. My son got out of high school nine years ago. And there were drugs readily available in our school system. He went to Ken Island High School. Um, I was a mother who knew a lot about the drug issue and drinking, and yet he did it right, right you know, under my nose. And um, he got addicted. And I can tell you today, my son is clean and sober, but um, he went through two rehabs, and it was a very difficult process. Right now, we don't have sober living homes in Queen Anne's County, except one, and the woman who runs it prefers to remain underneath the radar screen. So we need to do some of that. We need to move into treating the folks who got addicted years ago, are still addicted, and are, are dying. Um, and one of the things that we've done, we've received an Opioid Operation Command Center grant to open a recovery community organization. So it's kind of the newest thing. It works um, with the county, with um, the medical facilities and all of that, but it's run by peers and people who do not have an official capacity um, because many folks who are in trouble don't want to go into the health department. They don't want to go to the police department. They have a lot of things going against them. So they can walk into this place. We have peers who are there all the time, and it's currently located in Talbot County, although the grant came to Queen Anne's County. We hired a member from the Queen Anne's County Health Department, and she's overseeing the project. But they're there all the time. They connect them to resources. We have driven people to rehab. We get them the certification that they need. We hook them up with jobs. I'm happy to tell you that we have already partnered with Anthony and Laura Reno, and they are going to fund the first class of peer recovery specialists. So we've got eight people who will get that training to become peers and work here in Queen Anne's County and the other counties. So there's so much more to do, but thank you for the funding, thank you for the hard work, and let's continue to do that so we can help the people who are a little bit older, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So one thing Dr. C didn't mention was his peers that he has at the health department. Um, I am always uh, talking about the peers that go through the health department. They um, are amazing uh, people who reach out to those. Um, even though they're with the health department, they've uh, done, the, done the walk and do the talk, uh, but they are um, not as threatening as some of the government officials that people don't want to be involved with. So they will do transportation. They will get people into, they will find housing for them. They'll find a, a recovery bed. They do the hard work to get pla them to, to places um, that none of us know how to access. There are so many recovery places that are not in our county. I keep, can't say that enough, is we need resources in our county. We're shipping people out of our county. But the peers at the health department are amazing, and um, they can be a great resource. They'd probably be a great resource for uh, Graysonville, so. <laughs> and to see. talk further about that, <laughs> the peers have done an extraordinary job in Queen Anne County. And one of the things that we have done from the very beginning with our peers, when there is an overdose and Narcan is administered, it is the rule in Queen Anne County that individual gets transported to a hospital. And at that emergency room and hospital, that's where our peers are notified at the time of dispatch where the ambulance is going to deposit that patient, what facility, that peer will meet not only the patient, but the family, and will assist in trying to get them into immediate treatment, or if immediate treatment is not available because of lack of beds, then they will continue to work with them until we can get them into treatment. One of the glaring deficiencies in the state of Maryland is the lack of adolescent crisis behavioral health and substance use abuse for our, our adolescent population. It's a shame that we have to ship our patients to Delaware for treatment. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. It's one of the biggest issues that we hear. And I know um, this is one of the Secretary of Health's goals. It's one of our goals as an administration is to increase access to adolescent services because you're right, they're just not there. And the ones that were open several years ago closed and now we are sending people to Delaware. There are three uh, treatment centers in Maryland that accept teens 
uh, but only one of them accepts Medicaid, and that's also a huge, huge issue. So it's, it's something that we're focused on. Well, I think that uh, we, we are working on that, and we are focused on that. And I don't know, Bill, do you want to come up and say anything about the Witsit Center and what we're trying to accomplish uh, with uh, the adolescent beds and, and uh, the rehabilitation? I don't want to speak out of turn here, but, you know, it's, it's a process. And we, we've started the process working with the state, and, you know, that's, we recognize the fact that we need beds. Certainly. Um, okay. Is, is this work? That's, yeah, yeah. Is it working? Oh, there yeah. we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the, when, at the, at the Upper Shore Community Mental Health Center, which is where the AF Witsit Center is located, there used to be a juvenile detention center there that was vacated by the Department of General Services. We were working at this time to looking at taking that space that had 16 beds and we're trying to uh, figure out how we can use that space to serve the, the child and adolescent population of the, the Eastern Shore and the Upper Shore specifically. And it is, uh, you know, one of the problems that we have had is that, that our facility has not been maintained and it needs some capital renovation. The Moore Miller administration came in earlier this year and has provided a $4 million grant to address some of those shortcomings. We're hoping with that infusion of capital and the renovations that are forthcoming that we will be able to use the space <coughs> to provide ser residential services for children and adolescents. And the benefit of residential treatment is that it helps get people out of their normal environment. Making changes is enormously difficult. And, and you know, jump-starting that process by getting folks out of their regular environment has shown to be very effective in getting, you know, getting our children on the road to recovery. So it's a work in progress, uh, and we are going to keep, keep, uh, keep at it. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So they were the only three people signed up to speak today, but we have some time. So is there anyone else that would like to speak? Come on forward. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom McKnight, and um, I would like to thank the students back here because that's where all of this starts. Like Michael Jackson's song says, the man in the mirror, if you want to make a change, it's got to start with that man in the mirror. Years ago, I used to work with Queen Anne's County uh, State's Attorney's Office in the reset program. I think I've talked to Lance and I personally think we should try and bring that back and maybe call it something else and, sh and that. but let's get a hold of the kids before they go to you, before they go to the first responders and thank you guys for what you do. Mm -hmm. I personally have been there and done that and I've got 32 years of sobriety. And I started at a very young age, at like 12. That's when, and I've spoke to high schools between here and California. I think that would be a big help too, is to get people like myself and other been there, done that people on these stages to talk to these students as a whole, because like I said, that's where it starts. You know, I can talk to adults until I'm blue in the face. But like I said, you are the guys that are rocking. That's got to say that. So that's all I have. I agree with you 100%. Um, and I think um, one of the earlier discussions about um, doing some community outreach, um, I really liked the kickoff event where um, you had the um, teenagers who were um, with the bands. Um, I think Ambassadors. We, mm -hmm. I think we need kickoffs for our younger community. Um, I mean, we can make speeches, but I think we need to be reaching out to them, and I think you've got great ideas. So and, I'd and, like to hear more of them. 
because I, I personally joined forces with Mothers Against Drunk Driving in 2007. So I have done all the VIPs, a lot of them, and I have hugged more parents than I could ever imagine just losing it because they've lost a child. No parent should outlive their children. That's mm -hmm. just not right. So thank you guys very much for what you all do. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Madeline Eskew. Um, I am a drug-free coalition student ambassador. Um, this has became my main passion over the past half year when I joined. Um, I lost my uncle to an opioid overdose in 2010 and I never got to have a good relationship with him. And then my cousin, who is my best friend in the entire world, has two years clean as of August. And he grew up in Maryland and he ended up moving to Florida so that he could get the resources he needed. But him and I have had a lot of conversations um, about the connection between mental health and drug use. Um, I started the Students for Wellness Club at Kent Island. Uh, we are a mental health club where we do different events to raise awareness about mental health in our school, and I'm hoping to spread it to other schools in the county, although I am a senior so I guess they would have to do it. But um, I just wanted to ask what connections you've found between mental health and drug use and what you're doing to help. Well, first of all, what a legacy to live for, leave for your senior year to start that. Congratulations. That's incredible. I would say co-occurring mental health and substance use disorder, it's, it's more often than not. Um, so that is something that is a big focus. Uh, right now, a lot of the issues that we hear are with funding and insurance. So if you're treating one, it doesn't pay for the other. And that's a huge barrier, something that we've been meeting with private insurers and Medicaid about to see how we can fix that. Um, and also, I know a lot of substance use treatment centers are now starting to treat mental health. Um, I mean, we know the connection is there. And you're absolutely right. We didn't do enough of treating both for a very long time. My cousin has borderline personality disorder. Yes. And I was diagnosed with the same thing six months ago, around the same time I joined the club. Um, that's kind of revealing, but um, it's just, I've seen kids at our school struggle, like one of my best friends. We were in middle school and I watched her struggle with mental health with her parents, and then she led to drug use. Yeah, we know a lot of people who use substances are unfortunately doing it to mask They're trauma. masking their trauma. Or masking, yes, childhood trauma, trauma that they're experiencing there, mental health issues. They do often go hand in hand, people just trying to make themselves feel better. And one of the things that Dr. Salen has brought to this is the discussion of ACEs evaluation on children, adverse childhood experience. And we're talking about children under five. We're talking about the amount of trauma that then is associated with those children. Then that goes into a behavioral issue. And it, because of the pain they're trying to suppress and cover, they have a high propensity for narcotics, painkillers, vaping, marijuana. So these are all gateways too. But the basis of what we're trying to say here is we need to address our young population. And I applaud you for what you're doing. And if you want a part-time job in the health department, <laughs> you come up Monday and see me Thank you. because you're doing an excellent job. Thank you so much. I just wanted to open the conversation about mental health and drug use for you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak this evening? Once I get my sea legs, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I'm Ward Wright, and I was going to read a list of all the things we've been trying to do.
for the uh, uh, issue, and uh, I'm not going to spare it with you, but recently we sat down and got together and said, what do we do next? So what we'd like for you to do is every once in a while, uh, we think that we have a really great idea. And if there was a clearinghouse where we could send those and others could send to a central thing and it come back to us and not particularly come back to the DFC, but it comes back to our communications person or to Channel 7 so that we can take those and share them and also copy exactly what they're doing. Uh, that would be very helpful for, the, helpful for the locals if you could do that. The other part of that is some of your commercials are really good. We think ours are good, but yours are really good too. <laughs> and if there's a way that we could get those to us, uh, maybe they go somewhere and we don't have access to us, but we have pretty good communication. So if there's a direct line that we could get that stuff to us so we could share it in Queen Anne's County and share the things that uh, we're kind to of doing here. You know, the trend for the Drug Free Coalition uh, since Julie and the, uh, the OOTT grant has kind of changed the way that we do things. And so my question is, uh, I think we've had the grant for three years. Will that grant offer be continued for next year and years to come, can you say? If, it, if it was a grant through us, there they have to go through the application process. Oh, I'm, I'm aware of that, but I'm saying w next year will that same grant opportunity be available? Yes, it will be. Okay, great. And are there other things, other grant opportunities that we'll be made aware of? A absolutely, yeah. The opioid restitution fund, which is the settlement funds that are coming through the state of Maryland, we're expecting over $400 million, um, over the next 18 years with more coming in. Um, we have received some of the first settlements and that will be going through a grant process as well. Yeah, I just want to add too, uh, for everybody listening, uh, one year we didn't get the grant and the commissioners came through for us and fielded it and uh, uh, almost 100% funded it for all of us. And so we want to thank the commissioners for that too. Uh, last thing, uh, did I say there's several parts? There's another part. Um, we have a really great programs here, and maybe they've slowed down a little bit because of uh, the health issues. But we have Celebrate Recovery, Alcoholics Anonymous, and NA that are just fantastic, and they go way out of their way. But they only get, and I know you don't do treatment, but treatment gives them nothing. There will be occasionally a provider that will work with them, but for the most part, none. And because there's no coordination there, they're losing a whole lot of things that would work together for an individual. So if whatever you could do, uh, that is something that we're lacking here, and I'm sure we're lacking it in other places. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And just to answer your first part of your question, um, it, Anyone can always email help.occ at maryland.gov. That comes to our communications officer and then it will come to us. Um, also, the PSAs and the commercials that you hear are all available on before it's too late.maryland.gov. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, ma'am. Um, I am Tiffany Graham. I am the Assistant Program Manager at Cecil Community Recovery Center. Um, we are with BD Health, and I know that we have a MAT clinic coming to your county soon. I just want to say thank you for all you guys are doing. You guys are doing a great job. And I wanted to make a connection while I was here with you guys and maybe share some of the things that are working with us. I know that you guys are like in the process of trying to get new things for um, people who need help. And I know some things that are working in Cecil County, so they kind of like sent me here to be like, hey, you know, if we can connect and maybe give some ideas or you can give us ideas, like that would be a great connection for us to have. That would okay. be great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.
Good evening. My name's Eric. Um, I am actually a recovering alcoholic, and I run the Celebrate Recovery Program here on Kent Island that uh, Warren mentioned. Um, I kind of have three questions. I guess one is to the state, one is kind of more to local. Um, you brought up the drugs that are used to bring people down off of opioids, and that would be Suboxone and Methadone and so forth. What's being done to regulate those? Um, I I'll share a quick story on that because I know that my stepfather, who is now deceased, mm -hmm. was on the methadone program for 28 years. Mm. That is a program that is supposed to be designed to wean you off of the drugs, mm -hmm. the same as the Suboxone and so forth. What is being done to counteract on the state level that we're not continuously supporting an addiction in a legal manner where the state is profiting. So that's a slippery slope, right? Because that is a, that's a conversation that has to happen between a patient and a doctor. And I certainly am not the person to make that decision. If, if a doctor has a relationship with a patient and <clears throat> believes that methadone or insert medication for opioid use disorder name here is the appropriate choice for that patient, then that's between a, a patient and a doctor. Um, I'm I? not discounting what you're saying, and I do know, and we are well aware of instances where um, some things aren't being done the right way. And, and again, that is like on a federal level type of situation. So I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but when it comes to someone's treatment, and whether that's methadone or, or bup or whatever it is that I mean, that's between a patient and a doctor and what they think is the best course of action for that patient. I understand completely what you're saying, but methadone is not between a doctor and a patient. That is something that you go into a clinic and you get and they give it to you and you take it home. Yes, but the, are the doc, just like with the prescription pain medicines. They're being overprescribed, right? So it's the same scenario. Are we addressing it on the state and federal level what you all are responsible for mm -hmm. as opposed to what the individual who's buying the street drugs is responsible for? Does, does that make sense? It does. I mean, any time a medication is prescribed, especially medication for opioid use disorder, it is tracked by the DEA, and that's something that they do follow. Um, and there are prescribing guidelines and, and just like uh, filling guidelines for pharmacies. So I'm probably not the best person to give you that answer. Um, I'm not saying it's not on everyone's radar, because it is. but. And I wasn't looking for an answer. I wanted to get it out there so that it was in thought because I understand that that is a bigger issue than just something you can give me a yes or a no answer yes. to. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and my next one is towards the local with the signs, with the addictions and the death rate. And I don't know if this is true, which is why I'm asking this question. Are those numbers skewed? Because Queen Anne's County does not have a hospital. I have been told that if they overdose here, but die in Easton or in Annapolis, mm -mm. those numbers go to those counties. Mm -mm. We have Any, anytime that uh, we respond, the state police respond, uh, Centerville Police Department responds, um, those are true and accurate numbers. They're reported directly to a, a opiate um, liaison for the DEA. They are actually input into the system if it's not factual. And actually the, the program itself was designed um, actually in Queen Anne's County. Uh, Director Haas was part of the pioneering uh, uh, persons that, that established it. If it was not an overdose directly related to opioids, it is not put on that list. Only opioid overdoses and deaths are related to that list. And it doesn't matter if something happens to them in a different county, if they pass out, they die, or anything else it's still attributed onto that list and their factual numbers. Okay. Well, good. I like the signs. I like that they're there. And I think that they do give the awareness that yep. people are looking for and people need to know. Um, and then one more thing that I wanted to tag on to, um, the gentleman that came up and spoke a little while ago, these forums are incredible. They're great. They educate the parents. They educate the community if they're willing to get involved. 
and I know that you do it for the students too, but just like he said, what the students need to hear are factual stories, not education from the state or from the facilities. They need to hear a story that they can relate to. What are we doing to get more people to come in, whether it be from AA, NA, or any of the other various programs, which do exist pretty highly in this county. Our numbers for AA meetings and NA meetings are actually up since COVID, not down. The meetings have all reopened and added. So um, what are we doing to get addicts and alcoholics to share their stories to the students, not to the parents, not to, you know, the communities, but to the students? So, so one of our, our key priorities is, is <clears throat> education in schools and real education in schools, because let's be honest, just say no didn't work, right? Um, so uh, we are meeting with legislative directors next Thursday, actually, to discuss this very issue. One of them is a former educator to see how we can work with the Maryland Department of Education to, to do more, to do more. Unfortunately, what you'll see fortunately or fortunately, whichever you live in this in this state, every county has their own type of program for the most part. There is some drug education that's mandated um, through curriculum, but every county kind of does something different. So you could be here and they can have assemblies every single week with real life speakers or you can go to the county next door and they may do nothing. Um, so right now it just depends. It's kind of county specific. And so we're looking at how we can hopefully change that. So that's something that falls on the Board of Education. Well, not necessarily because the Drug Free county. Coalition, we, when we speak, last year we spoke to all the six grade classes. We had a mother that worked for the Board of Education who lost her son to an overdose. So she got up there, picture, told the whole story, broke down. I mean, it, was, it was very powerful, almost to the point where we didn't know if we were doing more damage to those kids. But I, I got to believe it was ingrained in their, in their mind how this affects the family. Uh, so I, I think it was uh, very powerful for them. So, you know, we've had Ray Lozano come here and speak to the kids. So we, we try to find somebody different every year to come. We don't want to be the same people going up there all the time. You know, maybe we do it on an every other, every third year, and then get somebody else in there uh, to reinforce it. But we, we, we think that's very critical, and, and it's something we definitely are pushing. Uh, and by the help of Dr. Salen's approving it, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to do it. I support that, and I hope that we're going to get better on that. Yes. Um, but if we think we're traumatizing the kids, mm -hmm. we need to traumatize them more. Because I grew up in that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And it took me till I was 36 before I put the bottle down and started to do something. And it was because of what happens in the families and in the households. We, it was said by several people, we need to reach kids early. Absolutely. But I thank you guys for what mm -hmm. you're doing. Congratulations you. on thank your recovery. You. So we are almost at time, but is there anyone else who would like to speak? Just want to offer the opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Avery Mortimer. I am in 10th grade at Queen Anne's County High School. I have two things I would like to bring to your attention. I know many people through different activities and clubs and just high school in general and meeting people in classes. In my 15 years of life, I have not known anyone personally close to me that has died to substance abuse. However, I more fingers and toes that are in this audience right now, I can name names that are currently using and abusing substances. It is not the problem that concerns me with the later. It is the problem that concerns me with the before and the now. So many of my peers are abusing because they feel that they cannot go to people such as yourselves and be able to not feel judged or ashamed. I know many people, not many, but more than what should be, that have overdosed and have survived, have gone to rehab, have recovered, and have gone back to their lives at school but felt so different, have felt that they've gone through so much that they could not fully reacclimate. Students that have fallen behind because they no longer felt that they could find themselves in the schoolwork. They've gone through so much trauma and they've recovered, but they just didn't fit ever quite the same. 
What are you going to do about these students who struggle internally every single day? I see their struggle. Teachers see their struggle. What are you going to do? I think stigma is killing people. We know stigma is killing people. And for those kids to feel different than their colleagues, I would venture to guess a lot of it is because of things that have been said about them or that they just don't feel welcome or they feel different. It, it's the same with adults. You know, the, that, the stigma of not wanting to say I need help because you're, for fear you're going to be judged. Or for someone who's using substances who hears someone call them a, a bad name, call them a junkie, call them something that's stigmatizing and just awful. We see it all over, and it's the reason people aren't getting help and it's killing people. Um, so I think eliminating stigma is something that we absolutely have to do when it comes to choosing our words, the way we talk to people, the way we treat people. People with a substance use disorder are human beings, right? <laughs> They're human beings. That's someone's child, um, someone's friend. And so I, I think treating people with dignity and respect is, is number one, first of all, and eliminating that stigma. And then, again, reaching our, our youth is just something that you've heard this whole time here. It's something that we're banging our heads, going like, how do, how do we make this happen more and, and consistently and often? Um, and it's something that we are focused on. Like I said, we're looking at even if it has to be legislated you know, with, with education, that we're going to do it. Let me ask you, what would you do to that individual that you were noticing the behavior, the comments? You as a friend, you as a co-student, what could you do or would you do? As a, as a peer and as a friend, I believe that the best that I can do and that you as, you as well can do is to give them the resources and the time without the stigma, without the pushback from other higher-ups, from the people in our school, the teachers even, and give them the time and resources and patience, such as tutoring, such as after-school programs that teach about not just addiction and stopping before it starts, but what do you do during and after. Teaching the importance of realizing that there is struggle and realizing that there is hope in that struggle. That's what I would do as a friend. What's what I am doing as a friend. Okay. Do you want people from, or do you think it would be a good idea to have people from the professional community or this community um, being available to students? I do believe that would help. However, being in my high school and understanding how my peers think, I think from a professional or such esteemed people as yourselves, students would have a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's the people, mm -hmm. as we were talking before, that are in this audience right now that have had those experiences that he has talked about earlier, that have those experiences to come in and to talk with our high schoolers, middle schoolers, and even elementary schoolers, because that's when it really starts. I have been offered things in sixth grade at the age of 11, and I know that for a fact there are people, your, your friends, your students, your children, that have been also offered things as early as 10 years old. I'm going to take you to testify in front of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> that was incredible. So do you think that the peers would be accepted by your fellow students? I can tell you they're not. I can tell you that there is a level of acceptance that everyone does it, especially vaping. Yep. It's no longer necessarily, I hate to say it, in the mindsets of my peers, a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's been so normalized that the pushback is no longer there, even though everyone, from my experience, I have the programs. I remember the county commissioners in sixth grade coming to talk with us, but so many kids just brushed it off their shoulder and went off with their day, that I don't know what to do. I honestly don't know what you could do, but there is something that needs to be done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you so much for my peers and everyone that's come here today. It's really important that we all work together to make this possible and 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, Secretary Keller. Thank you for coming. It's uh, let uh, Governor Moore, Lieutenant Governor Miller, let them know we really appreciate that in our district. I'm Delegate Steve Aarons. I represent the 36th District, Ken, Queen Anne, Cecil, and Caroline Connies. I just want to say we're going to need an advocate within the administration, which I hope it could be you. A lot of the things you've heard tonight are going to require one thing big and major thing, and that's money. Um, Queen Anne's County, I, I represent the only two counties in the state that doesn't have a hospital. We have an emergency room, but we don't have that. Healthcare is paramount. We have people in this room today uh, in the mental health business to try to help us with that, and the funding for that is also lacking. And I, I'm sure when you took this position, you knew that it's going to cost some dollars, and I'm hoping that uh, the governor understands that and he'll be able to allocate that. And I, I, I would offer to anybody on that panel, and I know most every one of you is, we could use, as the state, we could use your help. We can put in things. You've seen what's happened just recently with the juvenile, uh, what is it, the Juvenile Delinquency Act or whatever, with the statistics we've come out with, and you saw how that's been managed and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's highlighted to say that only 7% of the crime is juveniles. Well, 7 percent is a lot, and it, I'm, not sure I, I'm not sure I like the numbers, but something has to be done, and some of that comes out. I think it's uh, Attorney, or what is it? State, State um, Attorney Bates has mentioned something has to be done. The accountability factor has to come in, and that's something we're preaching. And I think, as a delegate and, and watching this and fully supportive of what you're doing, I think that's something we're going to need your help for, help with in, in Annapolis to sit back and convey that that it's going to take the dollars, it's going to take the will, it's going to take looking at some of the actions we've done in the past and trying to, to, to maneuver them into making it a better ending for us all. So I appreciate you coming. Thank Let you. the governor and the lieutenant governor know. We, we're happy to have you anytime you want to come over. Thank you and very much. Congratulations to all of you. You've done a good job. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Delegate. I, I definitely agree. Funding is, is always going to be an issue. Um, thankfully, in, in the first budget uh, that was passed last year, there was a um, almost $500 million increase for mental health and substance use disorder uh, specifically, and also with the opioid restitution money coming in. I think this is, can be and will be a very transformational time for Maryland. We have an advisory council that's met 10 times that's going to make recommendations to the governor and the secretary on how to use the money. Some of that money is coming direct into localities, so we're hoping that all the people on this stage meet with the health departments and, and the people out here who are doing the work to see how best to use that money. But we do know um, it's, it's a really hopeful time. That's almost a billion dollars right there um, in, in additional funds that we haven't had before. And yes, it's not all at once, but if we do it and do it right, it's going to be transformational for Maryland. Is that enough? No. And how do you put a price on a human life? I don't, you can't. Um, but I, I will certainly be your advocate, that's for sure. Sometimes the students that are fighting it, suffering from it, do not want to talk to anybody that has a title. Absolutely. They don't. They want to talk to people like me. I could write a book on how many people have called me over the years. I will, I will not tell anybody anything unless they want to hurt themselves or somebody else. Then I'll record them for whatever I have to do. That helps, like I said, more than anything else. I don't have a title. I don't have a degree. Been there, and I've done that, and sometimes that's better. Make sense? Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. I really appreciate your input, and um, we will take it into consideration as we move forward and, and combat this together. So I'm, I'm available. Please reach out to me anytime. Um, you can reach out on the beforeitstoolate.maryland.gov, which is our website. There's a ton of information on there. My team is always available. And thank you guys so much for joining us for the work that you do and uh, for all the providers in, in the audience and um, our EMS professionals here and everyone else. Thank you all for what you do. And I hope you guys have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.